We are recording. What's up, everybody? Drew here at thatanxietyguide.com. Back with Holly. How's it going, Holly? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. So um, it's the day after Thanksgiving here in the U.S. I just got done doing like an hour with Billy, and now I'm going to do some time with you, and it's podcast day for me. So we, we're going to do, for those of you following along with us, reading Hope and Help for Your Nerves, or what's your version of it called? You have the different- uh, Self-Help for Your Nerves. Self-Help for Your Nerves. Uh, if you're following along the book with us, we are up to chapter seven. Uh, which is cure of the, oh, it's backwards. Never mind. Cure of recurring nervous attacks. So that, that's a chapter we're going to go over today. And we usually start every one of these with like, this is a big chapter. We say it on every chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a, this is an insignificant. This chapter. is an insignificant chapter. You know, admittedly, I'm going to say this one might be, there are some really important things about first fear and second fear in this but I'm not going to call it like the most important chapter in the book because she just kind of goes through a bunch of symptoms. It's kind of like the same as the chapter before in a way. A little bit. Um, yeah. I think it, it, the one before we were, you know, we talked about truly accepting and floating and facing and all that stuff. And this, I think she starts to put it into practice. Yeah. All right. Well, you have to do it with the palpitations or skin, you know, blah, 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 blah. She goes through those. But I think that's important because lots of people do say like, I get the theory, but how, how right. Do how do you do it? Or, or those specific questions, like I understand I have to accept, but how can you accept like skipped heartbeats? Or yeah. how can you accept nausea? Blah, 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 blah. So we'll go through it. My screen just blacked out on me. Okay. So um, chapter seven, cure of recurring nervous attacks. Um, the first thing that I highlighted was uh, for me under the, the panic spasms, as already mentioned, fear can produce a state of constant tension or it can take the form of intense recurring spasms. And she calls them spasms of panic. Yeah. Which I think is different than a panic attack, right? I don't know. I just think it's an old fashioned word in. It is. It's funny. When I read spasms, I kind of feel like it's that, um, that's that quick flash. She uses flash all the time, that flash of panic. So I, I think she might be talking about that. But the point is she's acknowledging here that if you're dealing with this all the time and you're constantly sensitized to it, you, you can just be in a constant state of tension or on that hair trigger where almost anything is going to cause panic quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was the first note that I made um, where she's kind of acknowledging that. And I think, so if you are dealing with this sort of thing and you just feel like, I think there's an, an important um, distinction to make here. People who say that they have anxiety 24 seven or they are panicking 24 seven, I would say that maybe they are not panicking 24 seven, but they are in a heightened state. Yeah. Yeah. I would have said, I used to, I was one of those people that used to say, when I first like got ill with it, you know, I was, when I was very young, I would have probably told you that I had a panic attack that lasted eight months. You know what I mean? Like it right. seemed, because it was, it was eight months of sheer just hell, you know? Yeah. Um, and it seemed like I was, but I think actually probably it was what well, it had to be. It was panic attack, anxiety, 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 sure. panic attack, anxiety, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. And also what I learned last year or the year before whenever I had that sort of setback when I was pregnant it was just a couple of weeks but in my I think in itself that time distortion is kind of a symptom of anxiety yes and I think it's so easy for you to feel like you've been in this terrible way for ages that you'll be in this terror that you're like it all day long 24 7 and that you'll be like it for ages as well or like you know oh the last you know eight months have been absolutely hell for me and then right. if you'd actually like kept a diary or something you'd have looked back and be like oh and then I, I did this and I went here and I remember that was a good day and do you know yeah. what I mean yeah sure <laughs> keeping a diary is actually kind of important as well it's not a bad thing to do or even within a given day you know you may feel like I've been in a panic all day long but in reality you could probably look and say well I, I brushed my teeth for two minutes and I didn't, you know, that was seemed mindless. I really wasn't panicking when I was doing that, but she's acknowledging this, I think. And what creates that sort of reality distortion in, or the time distortion, because you're always at that elevated level. Like, you know, right now I'm sitting here and I'm completely relaxed. I'm sure you're, you're feeling the same way or maybe not because you have a one-year-old, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's, I'm just complete. I would not describe myself as in a state of anxiety right now, but when you are sensitized all the time, it feels like you're just constantly anxious. Yeah. Which, and because you're so aware of when you are, you're just aware of how you're feeling all the time, but kind of like, it just, 
it's just a constant sort yeah. of back loop of how am I feeling and you're looking for it as well. So yeah. I'm looking, do you know what I mean? Us sat here now, we're not looking for how no. we're feeling. If I really go looking, I'm like, actually, my foot's really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah, I, I couldn't care less how I feel right now. It's not an issue in my head in any way. So, And I, I would you, think that we're almost in a state, so maybe it's better to try and just reframe the way you're thinking or the way you're, you're you know, self-assessing say well instead of i'm feeling anxious 24 7 or i'm in a panic 24 7 i started to think about it in these terms as i'm almost in a state of pre pre pre-panic or pre-anxiety all the time you know where any moment and she goes on to say that where she and i highlighted where she wrote your nerves have become so sensitized that they discharge panic instantly at the slightest cause yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're always, you're at that heightened state where just about anything could, should put you over the edge. And now you are in an elevated anxiety state or even a panic attack. I remember driving along to, I was driving to Manchester and my, I was driving, I was like 17. And my boyfriend at the time, he was um, a Liverpool football club fan. And he was listening to the radio of like a football game and they scored a goal and he went, yes. And that sent me into just like the biggest panic attack. And I was like having a big gun. I'm just like, how dare you? What are you doing to me? You know, sure. like, be careful and everything. Sorry, my friends. Are you up a bit? That's all right. No worries. Yeah. And um, yeah, so like even someone like cheering at a football like score, like sent me into just like the worst sort of like panic. That's how sensitized. Yeah. And I was sort of, I thought I was okay. I was driving. I was driving along the motorway. Yeah. <laughs> No, because you're just wound up. I mean, it's and when you're so tense like that, it's like, uh, you know, it's like when you preload a spring. You know, you load the spring and bam, when you let go, it's tink, all the energy in the spring is dissipated. So, yeah, I get it. I remember and having that happen. Just get because, angry with him as well. Like, imagine. Uh, he must have been like, what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like he screamed out of the blue. You're actually listening to, the, you know, the game. So, you know. It's, it's yeah. so strange. I can remember having that happen. I think we t- I mentioned this in one of the ones we did last year, but it, it happening to me just driving along at, when the sun would go behind a cloud. So it would be very sunny out. And then all of a sudden it's not because the clouds, you know, like the earth and, and that would trigger like all of a sudden I would be, bam, I'd be into panic mode or, or heading right to that level seven, eight, nine, you know, toward panic. Yeah, yeah. So who the hell knows? You just so wound up and ready or like the phone ringing could be a panic trigger for me back in those days or anything. I remember having, um, it was so silly because smartphones were first sort of making the scene. And I think I have like a Palm Trio or some ridiculous early generation smartphone. And it had like, oh, I can, I can set alerts for like the weather and like ice hockey scores because I'm a hockey fan. And, and so every morning at like whatever time it was, I get like a little weather text or something. And it got to the point where I had to turn that off because I would dread it. Like, oh my God, I'm, I'm barely holding it together and the freaking weather text is going to come in and it would put me over the edge. So, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't panicking 24-7, but I was close. And that's what she talks about here. Yeah. Yeah. So she talks about the un- out of the blue thing. I don't know if you, if you noticed that part. She says, this is why panic spasms may often seem to come on Biden and out of the blue. Oh, uh, Okay. Like we don't seem to, and I hear that all the time. Like, I don't know why I was, I was just sitting there and suddenly I started to panic and you have to really think about that. Were you really just sitting there or are you in that heightened state wound up like a spring all the time, just waiting for the next attack to happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Because you know, a cloud covering the sun or someone cheering a football score, like that's not stuff that's panic triggerable really in the real right. sort of world, you know, right. that's it, not, you know, I mean, our ancestors in caveman times wouldn't have been like, oh, no, the clouds. Oh, like, no, right. <laughs> well, you know, um, so, so, yeah, that, that proves that you're not sort of in a normal state. Normal state, right. If you're finding that you have panic that comes out of the blue, it's probably because you're, in that, you're, you're worried about it and you're that heightened state of awareness about it. So this is all good. So what comes next? Analyzing fear, two separate fears. I, I highlighted the, sen- the first sentence there, cure lies in desensitization. And there is no doubt that the key to de- desensitization learns in learning how to cope with panic. It's pretty much like yeah. the basis of everything, even outside of her work is the basis of exposure and, you know, CBT and that sort of stuff is right there. That sentence essentially 
learning how to cope with, with panic. What's the sentence again? She says, um, so she starts talking about the two separate first fear and second fear. And she says, the cure lies in desensitization. And there is no doubt that the key to desen- desensitization lies in learning how to cope with panic. Yeah, absolutely. So instead of, and I think it says it right there, you know, that whole, you have to face it instead of avoid it or run from it. Like you don't get better by not panicking. You actually get better by panicking as ridiculous as that sounds. And she says it right in that sentence. So, and I think it's so important because I know people are working really hard on their exposures and stuff. And it's really important to just make, it's, it's like that subtle thing that makes such a big difference. Not panicking and being and feeling fine when you're out and about is great, but that is not like the, that's not the work that you're, you're doing. Not, you're going, the, the idea of the exposure is to go somewhere that makes you panic because you're, you want to, you're trying to trigger it. You're trying to bring it on. And so yes. <clears throat> when you bring it on, then it's just like a sure way of making yourself panic. So you, then you can learn how to yeah. deal with it. You just, I mean, if your panic's just coming on willy nilly out of anything, then fine. Maybe you don't even need to work on specific things in exposure. You just need to work on when you're feeling panic and going like, okay, great. I'm panicking. Yeah. <laughs> you can say, right now, I can you practice can yourself to say, okay, great. I'm panicking. Yep. But yep. We're halfway there. Because it's practice. And actually, I did, uh, this is funny because I, I did a little one minute video late last week, I think, sort of addressing that. Because somebody had asked me, and by the way, well, I'll oh, link the okay. Facebook group. If you're not in it, get in it. Just like I said in the one with Billy. Um, it's, it's just a good discussion group to be in. So somebody had asked if I can't, I see all these great exposure videos. People are getting out and, and doing exposure in the group. And she asked, well, what if I, I'm still homebound? I can't go out. So how am I supposed to do exposure? And the point is, like you just said, the point of exposure is not to teach yourself how to go to the mall. It's to, to teach yourself how to deal with panic and the anxiety symptoms. So yeah, and if that's happening in your living room, panic, right, then, then by all means, that's mall. your exposure. Exactly. Yeah. But if just sitting in your living room thinking about going to the mall makes you panic, then that's your exposure. Sit do there that. and do that. It's okay. Mm-hmm. So there's no right or wrong in where you're supposed to be desensitizing yourself. The yeah. object of the game is to learn how to, she says, learn how to cope with your panic. And it doesn't matter where that happens. So it, it doesn't matter. I'll add something to that because when I was in my sort of final sort of like stage of recovery, I, I was actually in touch with a really good um, psychologist in New York, actually. Um, and he, like, I sort of, I don't know why he took me on as a sort of pity case. Oh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he just let me email him and um, he would email me back with just like this, just the most amazing sort of insight and stuff and so he I would say to him like panic doesn't stop me doing anything because at this stage I was doing everything I was traveling I was flying I was working I was doing anything but I was just still in this constant you know still having to put up with all of this this stuff and so I was like how can I do exposure when you know everything's making me panic and he was just like well there you go. Like you just have to learn. And he, that was what he taught me. He was just like, sorry, I'm saying like a lot. And I'm sorry. (laughs) We got really annoyed in the last video. Hey, you say like as much as you want. Struggling to find the exact sentence that I would like to say. I didn't know how to bring on my panic because it, it seemed quite random and kind of quite constant as well. And I was getting out and about. And so I was just like, well, I can do everything but I just do it really badly because I'm just feeling terrible all the time. Right. And I hadn't really understood that thing of, it's not to try and do things without panic and it's to try and panic, which I was doing, but I wasn't accepting the panic and facing the panic when it happened. And it's so like yeah. subtle, but such a massive difference. And that's why I was white knuckling through everything. Yeah. Because I was doing everything. I was going to the mall. I was going on airplanes, going to work. And I was at work just like in a complete state. I was sniffing nail varnish to try and, you know, I get do it. anything other yeah. than what I was. And um, all I needed to do was sit there and feel that panic and be like, oh, okay, it's a panic attack. Right. It's not so what bad. It's going to be over again? Again? Yeah. 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 That's so true. And, and, and that's, I mean, it's very much, we saw one of those, I mean, I'm duplicating a little bit of what I just talked about with Billy, not that you're going to see it in a row anyway, but 
we actually saw a light bulb moment. Did you notice there's a post in the group last night, um, Gemma, who uh, yeah. wound up having to do a little bit of a forced exposure. And you could see when she got back home and thought about what had happened, she suddenly had, I even posted the light bulb gif, you know, <laughs> like as there's a little bit of a joke, but she suddenly had that, that moment of insight that said, Oh, right. I get it now. I'm yeah. supposed to panic to get better. You know, yeah. as she'd actually had been retreating from the panic every time it happened and wasn't, it wasn't sure. Well, how come this isn't working? Well, that's why. That's yeah. why. So Dr. Weeks really says, it. Claire Weeks says in this chapter, she says, if every time one of these panic spasms, panic attacks has been coming on, you've been trying to control it yeah. or, you know, like keep it down or you've just been like retreating from it and just go like, oh my God, oh my God, it's a panic attack. Then you're just adding fear to it. Right. And that is, you know, in all senses, purposes is wrong. Like, and you need to not try and control it, not mm -hmm. retreat from it and just let it happen, look at it, examine it, like, is it so bad, you know? Yeah. And just learn that it's not, and what's, she sort of talks about this in, in this chapter, it's not the symptoms, it's your fear of the symptoms. It's the fear right. that you're fearing. It's not, the symptoms could be anything. If your toe started tingling, would it cause you as much sort of distress? Well, you know? It, it would. I could tell you that for me, at, when I was at my worst, yeah, it absolutely would. So like any change in bodily state would, would be an issue. You know, anything. My, like my toe is tingling. Uh, uh, it would send me into that, that bad spot. Yeah, yeah. And so she, you know, as moving on in the chapter, she actually starts to talk about that, the two separate fears, the first fear and the second fear, which I think is the first time in the book that she starts to bring that up, I think. Okay. Um, so when Holly just says, it's not the symptoms, it's the way you react to the symptoms. It's your fear of the symptoms that causes the problem. So like agoraphobia, I know most people don't, if you're dealing with agoraphobia, you're, you're having a hard time leaving the house. You're not afraid of being out of the house. You're afraid of how you feel when you go out of the house. So agoraphobia is really fear of a, of a symptom attack than yeah. anything else. It's not a fear of where you're going to be. So, the, and she describes this, Dr. Weeks describes it as first fear and second fear. So the first, we can talk about that for a second, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, first fear, so she says, I'll explain these two separate fears more fully. Everyone experiences first fear from time to time. It's the fear that comes reflexively, almost automatically in response to some threatened danger. It's normal in intensity. We understand it. We accept it. Yeah, like this is it's just the same as someone what? going boop and jumping out on you, and you completely don't exactly. And and you're, but you're afraid. Suddenly, you have that flash of fear, or you're driving along, and and it looks like somebody's about to run into you with their car. You know that quick. Yeah. But that's normal. Nobody questions that. And it's it's a normal it. response. You can feel it. The adrenaline in your body. You can feel it there for a minute or two. You know? Sure. Like, sure. You and you, your heart sort of going like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. That was that was close. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, and we come to expect that. And so that is the standard flight or fight response, right? Fight or flight response. There's some danger. We see the danger. We respond to it. And then the danger passes and, and the fear dissipates. And that's perfectly normal. No one would question that. But the, the deal is, he, she goes on to say, um, we cope with the danger the fear fast passes. However, the flash of first fear that comes to a sensitized person. So if you're living at that heightened state, always worried about the next attack, um, the, flash, the flash of first fear that comes to a sensitized person in response to danger is not normal in intensity. It can be so overwhelmingly intense, so electric in its swiftness, so out of proportion to the danger causing it that a sensitized person cannot dismiss it. Indeed, he recoils from it, and as he does this, he adds the second fear, yeah. the fear of the fear. So... And, and that, those danger signals, uh, you know, when you're in that heightened state, it doesn't have to be an, a hungry bear or a lion or someone with a gun yeah. or anything like that. It could be your toe tingling. You misinterpret as danger. Bam, you get the flash of first fear. And then you are afraid of the fear that you just, you're, it's the fear of the fear. So, yeah. yeah. And I think she describes it pretty well. So when you're in that heightened state, just about anything can cause the first flash and then the exactly. second flash happens. That's why the cloud covering the sun up, someone cheering the football Bam. court. That's the same as someone jumping. That's at first, right. It, it is. It is. It's inappropriate. It's not right. But in that heightened state, yes, the cloud cover or the goal in the football match 
becomes the same as someone jumping out with a knife. And there's nothing you can do about that first fear. No, it it's okay. You can't help it. The more tense you are, the more likely you are. That's to exactly right. Like get that whoosh. Yep. But like, yep. Nothing you can do about it. That's your amygdala. No. I believe. If we yes. Yeah. Music. This is sort of, it's sort of <laughs> autonomic. Yes, it is true. And that's the auto one and it goes. And so that adrenaline's in your body. There's nothing you can never nothing like you learn yourself not to, not yes. to have that's there to save your life. You know, and, if you, that's super important, by the way, because I think we even had somebody posted in the group about that. They feel like they're making progress, but I can't remember who it was. But whenever he gets that feeling, he <clears throat> he in it, he almost involuntarily he coughs, <clears throat> covers his throat, and does that thing. It's just become a habit, right? We all develop them, and he knows that it's a safety ritual. He's trying to escape that sensation that just hit him, that that startle. He called it a startle, yes. which is which is really good, a really good explanation. I think a startle. I'm like, well, how do I stop doing that? You don't stop doing that. You never stop doing that. But what will happen is as you go down the road, fewer things will cause that flash, that yeah. start. Yeah. So you're right. You cannot program that away. So don't judge yourself as not making progress if you still get that quick, huh, you know, that, that quick fear. It's yeah. going to happen. It's just going to happen. The, the secret is once it happens, what do you do? Yeah. That's you know? where the whole key lies is so when you feel that, Woof, and yeah. You your heart's beating and all of that stuff, people that are in this sensitized state and suffering anxiety, sure. they feel those sensations, they feel the whoosh and they think, oh my God, and that, oh my God, that instant fear and recoil from it all, the sort of like try and keep this under control, Right. that just triggers more adrenaline because your brain interprets that you're in danger because yeah. why would you be so recoiling and, and scared of something if it wasn't dangerous that the fear response itself the racing heart the dizziness to whatever your symptom is of fear which are normal then gets interpreted as itself being dangerous yeah which it is not yeah. right so the fear takes on a life of its own it's not the hungry lion that's chasing you anymore it's the racing heart itself that becomes yeah. the source of the fear so the secret to success there is to stop the second fear by if that happens, you have that flash of fear. For me, I'll use myself as an example. You know, the sun goes behind the cloud as I'm driving. I get that quick, you know, that, that quick thing. And it's an intense flash. Oh my, oh my God, the right, that's okay. The fact that that happened is, would be fine. The better way for me to have handled that would have been to just relax and understand like, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's the flash. Now I just have to make sure I don't add to it and just, just chill and understand oh, my heart's going to race. I might feel a little weird for a minute or two. Don't add to it. Don't, don't do anything. Cough if I have to, like the person in the group does. Yeah, Whatever yeah. my little reaction is, let it happen. Understand why I did it. Up, oh, I'm doing my ritual. I think it was Fine. someone called Jackie who did a video and she said she's got a bracelet and she wrote, don't add. Don't oh. add. Yeah, the rubber band. Amazing. That was so brilliant. Yeah, don't add as a reminder. She doesn't snap the rubber band. She, it's just a reminder that says, oh, don't add any fear to this. Yeah, yeah. Oh my but, God, if I had a tattoo, like I wanted to find a tattoo that I could just like put on my wrist. That was just, like, don't add. <laughs> don't panic. Like, <laughs> don't, don't panic. Stop it. Just stop. Stop so. it. Yeah, I didn't do that. I wound up putting a pineapple. Uh, so um, anyway, yeah, so that's the, the flash of the first fear, which is normal. And then adding the second fear is really where like the disorder starts to be defined, right? Or starts to develop. So what does she write about this? Um, he, adds, he adds the fear of the first flash. He may be much more concerned with the physical feel. Okay, this is it. Indeed, he may be much more concerned with the physical feeling of panic than with the original danger. So yeah. yes, the panic. So when you have panic disorder, which can lead to things like agoraphobia, the, the panic itself is what you're afraid of. Yeah. So one, when that sun went behind the cloud and then you went into the, and then yeah. you went, then you weren't still continuously scared of the sun going behind the cloud. No, I didn't care about the sun anymore. That you were having a panic attack. Right. I completely took, what got me was the change in light. And I, so if I, I can actually think that through, cause it seems so vivid to me still something is wrong. Like something just, ha what just happened? Like yeah. what ha not what happened to the sun. I'm not a caveman. I didn't think that a dragon ate the sun, but like it was a change of state and it would leave you to bliss. What just happened? Something just happened. Why did the sun get suddenly different? Is it, there's something wrong with my eyes? Am I something wrong with my brain? Or did something literally happen that made the sky go dark or something like that? That's the first thought that I would have. And it's irrational because I was oversensitized. And then Within seconds, I didn't give a rat's ass about the sun anymore. I was 
all about what was going on inside yeah. after that. So that was just a trigger. And then I just turned completely inward and I was all worried about what was happening in my brain and my body. And what am I thinking? Oh my God, this feeling, my, I'm not seeing right. My eyes, my, my, bleh, whatever. And so I, the sun became irrelevant. It didn't matter anymore. So yeah. very, when, very yeah. tough. When my boyfriend should Liverpool score in a goal, it wasn't, I didn't think I was in danger. It was just, he made, he made me jump. Yeah. You know, it's like someone saying boo. Right. So it took me by surprise because I was wound up like a, a coil. It yeah. took me by surprise. And I was like, oh, and then I went into the, and then I felt awful. And so, well, I felt like yeah. anxiety. Sure. <laughs> and sure. that was what would then continued me off into like this huge panic attack. It wasn't that I thought I was in danger because a no. goal scored and someone cheered. It's no, like, the jump. cheering is irrelevant, right? Exactly. And yeah. then me jumping and having those sensations in my body made me go like, oh my God, yeah. what's happening? So I think what we're both describing here is a situation where there's an external trigger, your boyfriend yeah. cheering the goal, or for me, the sun or whatever it is, or a blast of cold air, the wind blows, could have been anything, right? But yeah. that trigger, so it's an external trigger that then turns you completely inward. And that's when bad things happen is when you're focused completely inward. And let's but, just say, well, sometimes there isn't a, a noticeable external trigger. Right. The trigger could be yeah. internal also. So your trigger, you could be focused inward and triggered by feeling one skipped heartbeat. That was me. I would get PVC and one internal trigger, then bam, it would start it. So that trigger can be external and then you turn inward or you could already be, be inward. Thought. Could be, be thought. Thought could be a thought. Could be a thought. That's exactly right. I never really dealt with that so much. I don't know if you did, but I know yeah. people will say like, oh, the negative thought started and that would get me down the road. I never dealt with thought triggers too much, but, um, but yeah, so the trigger could be external. Then you turn inward and the snowball starts rolling down the hill, or you could already be inward, find an inward trigger and the snowball starts rolling down the hill. Cause it's really insidious when you think about it. It's yeah, tough yeah. to get out of this nonsense. Whatever the trigger is, is kind of irrelevant. Right. And that's what's important to remember. So like if your trigger is going to the mall, right. Like just use it as a tool to make yourself panic to learn how to panic. Yes. And and this is why we can't go down a list of um I know some of the most popular things that I've ever seen that like Billy and I've done together or he's done on his channel, top symptoms, lit top ten list of symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and top anxiety triggers. People love to talk about their triggers. And you can't go through life trying to eliminate each trigger. Right. Don't make a list of your triggers and try and eliminate them all because anything can be a trigger. That's not the point. You, you know, does, it's irrelevant what the trigger is. Totally irrelevant. Yeah, it's your and response that matters. Yeah, and kind of like why you got ill in the foot, why you got panic disorder in the first place. Right. Kind of irrelevant. I'll like, tell you why, because your brain learns some really bad habits. It's just yeah. bad cognitive habits. We can learn bad habits about eating and sleeping and wearing ugly clothes, but we can, we can also learn bad cognitive habits. That's how you got panic disorder. Yeah. And, and, it, it doesn't matter if your panic attack was caused by hormones or by trauma or anything. Doesn't Stress, right. It doesn't matter. The, the getting better bit, this recovery bit of getting better from spending your life terrified of the way you feel and like the next attack that you're going to have it that's what's important and you get better the same way it doesn't yes. matter isn't it? it doesn't matter what the cause was because i think when you look at this chapter and talking about that flash and the first fear second fear how to deal with it you realize that a panic attacks is not panic disorder so I've heard so many people say that too. Well, how do you, why do you think you have panic disorder? Because you have panic attacks. No, a panic attack is not an anxiety disorder. It's just yeah. a physical event. So it's the reaction. It's the second fear that that's a problem. So she goes on to say, I mean, oh my goodness, here it is again. I don't know if you, um, a couple paragraphs down. A nervously ill person has only to think of being trapped for first fear to flash instantly. Oh my God, uh, yeah, big time. That was my- Right? Opinion. Being yeah. trapped, yeah. Um, what of it, yeah. To this, he immediately adds plenty of second fear as he thinks, oh my goodness, here it is again. So I can't stand that. I'll make a fool of myself. These are the internal thoughts with the snow. When I say the snowball starts rolling downhill and you can't stop it. As soon as you get into, oh my God, oh my goodness, what if, you know, what, what if, what if, oh my God, that's, that's when you're in second fear territory. So... This hovering threat holds such a menace that at the peak of panic, the sufferer thinks he can no longer think clearly or act calmly. So it distorts yeah. your, your view of yourself, right? 
That's the hard, I think that's the hardest thing. I mean, if you could think logically and rationally when you're having a panic attack, I think it would be quite easy to recover. Oh, sure. You know, yeah. you just be like, oh yeah, I just remember to like accept it and face it, right. and then do that. You know, <laughs> it's nobody the, would have panic disorder. We, yeah, exactly. Or for more than two weeks, right? It'll be all over. Yeah, you go. Oh yeah, oh, I just need to remember to do that. Yeah, because you're obviously your, all your sort of rationale and logic and stuff goes out the window, and that's kind of the hardest bit. That's why it's good to maybe write something down and yeah, tattoo it on your wrist or whatever you know yeah what I mean? the the rubber band yeah. no yeah don't add you know and so and what she's talking about in this paragraph too is you know so you know whatever triggers this poor guy something triggers him and he goes into oh, oh here it is again oh no oh my god and he begins to have panic and it mounts and all the symptoms come and he starts to feel worse and worse and he thinks he can't act clearly and suddenly you're in that mode and we've all been there if you're watching this you have been there that like, I got to get out of this. I need, I need to escape. You run out of the room, you go back home, you run to your car, you get out of the car, whatever you need to do that you're trying to escape that situation. That's a mistake. And it's what leads to that shrinking of your circle. Like your lifestyle gets smaller and smaller because you start avoiding things. You know, I had a panic attack in a restaurant, so I cannot go back to a restaurant, but that's a mistake because it wasn't the restaurant that caused it. It was yeah. It was how you added that second fear and reacted to your symptoms and your sensations. That's the problem. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what caused it. It doesn't matter if it was the restaurant. Right, it doesn't matter. But, but if you associate it, and it's normal. Our brains do that. If, if a dog bites you, you will become afraid of a dog. It's normal. So if you have a panic attack in a restaurant, you can easily start avoiding restaurants, but you're missing the point. It's because you can avoid a restaurant if you want, but then you'll have a panic attack sitting in your backyard and then you won't want to go in your backyard and then you'll have one in the shower and then you won't want to take a shower. So yeah. Yeah. yeah when if you start avoiding it, you then it's dangerous, isn't it? Because you're, yes. you're the world begins to shrink and that's when you start to get toward agoraphobia and that sort of stuff. So it's so important to understand what she's talking about. He doesn't understand that it is all these, Oh my goodnesses, all these what ifs that build up into what he calls a crisis. So it's, it's not the restaurant or the wherever it's, it's what, it's what's going on in your head that causes it. Um, if he could realize that his body is not a machine, it has a limited capacity to produce adrenaline that therefore the first fear can only come in a wave and must always die down, but he waits and he does not fall into the trap of stoking, but only if he waits and he doesn't yeah. fall into the fear, the trap of stoking it with second fear. Yeah. So if you have that flash of fear that's and an adrenaline dump, you are just stoking it, aren't you? The more yes. you, you're just stoking that you're just fire. just adding adrenaline, you're adding more. So just strictly from a chemical and physiological standpoint, you know, if the guy jumps out of the dark alley and points a knife at you, you're going to have that dump. Your heart's going to race. You're going to be dizzy. All those things will happen normally. Whatever. You give, him his, you give him your wallet, he goes away, or you punch him in the nose and he goes away. Either way, the danger goes away. It's gone your adrenaline will dissipate. So after five or six minutes, you'll start to feel normal again. Same thing happens in panic. So when you have that flash, uh oh, my heart just skipped a beat. If you just, not oh, my heart just skipped a beat. Just let it go. Don't add it. Don't fight it. Don't, oh my God, don't what if. Same thing will happen. You might have a huge adrenaline dump and feel shitty for five or seven minutes, but it, it'll go away if yeah. you don't. But if you, if you fight it, you're just going to keep shoveling more adrenaline on top of the old adrenaline. Yeah, definitely. One yeah. thing she doesn't, well, I think our versions are differing slightly because I haven't got okay. half of the stuff you're saying. Oh. But one thing that I think is really important is that everyone talks about like the physical symptoms that happen in a panic attack. But I think what's really important and that I discovered is just that the, the negative thoughts and the what ifs and oh my God, and like that's all part of it. And you have to treat that as a symptom as well. You mm -hmm. cannot trust any of your thoughts you have when you're anxious. If you're going, Ooh, maybe my heart's, do you think my heart's okay? If you're feeling anxious when you're thinking that, just don't even listen to those thoughts. Those thoughts are absolutely not to be trusted and you can't engage with them because that is the equivalent of stoking the physical. Symptoms. Yes, yes. Engage those thoughts, treat them as a symptom. Yep. They are like, you are not thinking rationally when you're having a panic attack or when you're anxious. So don't expect your thoughts to the what if thoughts why are you giving them any sort of respect because right. all your other logic's gone out the window so just ignore everything you're thinking which is so hard to do but that's very but, true 
to. But I think that is so important. It, to do. It's more important than the physical symptoms. And so we, and we've seen it, you and I both, you can talk about the physical symptoms all day long, every day, 24 seven. Does anybody get this? Does anybody feel this? What about this symptom, this sensation? My shoulder hurts, my toe is tingling, my nose is whatever. It doesn't matter. In the end, it is a cognitive issue. So it's what's going on in your head that matters more than anything your body feels. I can't breathe. My heart is racing. My legs are rubbery. It feels like I'm going to pass out. All those things don't matter. It's what's going on in here that actually matters more than anything else. And so yeah. I always say, like, don't engage in an inner dialogue. Do not yeah. engage those thoughts. So the, what, you might be, you, you can't really stop sometimes the what if thought from coming in. What if I'm having a stroke? Okay, all the best you can do. And this is where like your meditation, learning how basic meditation skills come in. Let the thought come in. Let it go. Do not answer yourself ever. Yep. So you should not be having a conversation in your head. No conversation. Do not engage with those thoughts because they will screw you up. The way I see it is like if you're trying to like say your husband comes in and he's really drunk and you're like really mad at him and you're trying to talk to him about something yeah. like proper that needs to be sorted out. Right. Just don't even bother. What's like you point? can't have a conversation or you're down the pub and someone's trying to talk about politics and they're really drunk. You, it's not going to happen. There's just no rationality wait, there. Wait till they're sober and then talk to them then. Do you know exactly. what I mean? You just have to wait it out. And it's the same thing. You can't have a, a logical discussion and like, oh, no. maybe, maybe that. And I'll try no. and rationalize it like this. Don't even bother. It's like your brain is completely drunk. Just ignore it. Wait yeah. for it to sober up and just have, have a think with yourself later, you know? And what sounds kind of crazy too is I often hear people say like self-talk. You know, people talk about self-talk a lot. Like, well, when you're in a panic situation, use your self-talk. You reassure yourself. I'm okay. I'm okay. No, believe it or not, I really think that's a bad idea because yeah. you are engaging in an inner dialogue because the minute your brain says, what if I'm having a heart attack and you start, well, no, my heart is fine. The next thought will probably be, well, but what if it's not? There's, you cannot ever. No, and have you heard about this new test? Right. And, and you can't ever, you can't win an argument with yourself mm -hmm. when the answer is always what if. So your emotional terrified side is, is doing what if, and your ni nice, logical, rational, intelligent side is saying it's not a heart attack. But then it's just another what if, but what if? What, and what if is always valid? Like there always could be what, what if there's a dinosaur next door about to smash through my building? Yeah. Could be, you know, not likely, but it could be. And that's so the thing. You, you have to learn an argument to, with yourself. You have to learn to be okay with the sort of worst case scenario that yep. your brain yep. is telling you. Like, what if this isn't a panic attack? What if it's a heart attack? Okay. And just let that voice go. And you'll learn over time as you get good at these techniques that voice will, you can make it go away to a certain extent. The thought will come in, you give it no credence and the thought goes away. But even when you can't do it that well, essentially just imagine the, the, what I used to imagine was it was somebody standing next to me just screaming as loud as they could in my ear. And I would just look ahead, don't look at them. Just, it just became, remember, I don't know if you guys had over there, uh, Snoopy, Charlie Brown, the Peanuts cartoons. And yeah, they, yeah. yeah they would do, I, I know I'm dating myself a little bit, but with the Peanuts animated like Christmas specials and stuff would be on TV here. And the Peanuts gang was just kids. So whenever you heard an adult in their world, you didn't hear, the adult was speaking and they would never, you wouldn't hear words. All you heard was wah, 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 wah. That was an adult speaking. It was not legible. It was not words. And for a reason, it was all about a kid's world. Yeah. That's what I would imagine. Like not just jawing at me, like you're having a heart attack, you're having a stroke. And then this time it said, you really went to the hospital. I would literally think of the person screaming in my ear, just hearing wah, 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 like unintelligible. Go to hell, F you. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and that is what mattered. It wasn't self-talk or reassurance or any of those things. It was just letting it go in one ear and out the other and paying it no matter. It's just the drunk guy in the pub ranting about something. Does it, it's irrelevant. And, and it's so hard. I know people are probably saying, yeah, it sounds really good, but how the hell do you do that? Sometimes you can do it either by learning to just ignore that and not engaging in any inner dialogue. Sometimes you can do it by replacing those thoughts with other thoughts, but, but that's not an inner dialogue. You're not refuting what you're hearing. So essentially it's when that, that voice in my head is screaming, but this time it might really be a heart attack. My response is, I wonder you know, if the Rangers won last night. Yeah. 
right? Or, you know, you, this probably a stroke. I could feel my face tingling. It means you're having a stroke, Drew. My response to that might be like, I really love like pepperoni on pizza. Do you, does it make sense? Like it's not an, and I'm not saying it's not a stroke. It's not a tumor. It's, you know, it's, it's a because, completely different thought. Because trying to reassure yourself is the same as like being sort of going like, oh my God, what if it is? Saying like, no, it isn't because of this and this and this. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That's engaging. Don't engage with it. In a dialogue. Just- so either just quiet, don't, no response if you can do it, or in the beginning, probably until you learn that, you could just replace that thought with a completely different thought. Yeah. And I, I had a therapist way back when that made me write a list on my phone. I still have it in my notes app of things that I liked. And I, and I remember thinking like, what do you mean things I like? Like, and she's like, no, not Nirvana. Just like, tell me what you like about your car. And I had heated seats in the car. She's like, write that down. You know, what else do you like? Like stupid little things like pizza crust or like stupid little things that I liked. And I would literally try and replace the bad thoughts with like thinking about the heated seat in my car. And that worked until I got better at just like wah, wah, turning it into wah, 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 yeah, the Charlie Brown adult voice. <laughs> so yeah. I think I did it in the end by just um, kind of doing the, well, t- like making that leap of faith as well of just like, I know everything in my sort of brain is telling me this one thing and that I'll sort of probably die if I carry on and go down here, but I'm going to just go on just that blind sort of, you know, when you just yeah. jump, just like, fuck it. Right. <laughs> <Just> go. <laughs> but that's that courage that we talk about. You have yeah. to have it. It's main ingredient. If you're going to follow this formula, got to have yeah. it. Yeah. Well, at some point you've just got to go like, I'm just right. Gonna... Right. I... And do the opposite as well is, is a very good thing. Cause sure. everything the brain's telling you is like, sort of you know spiked with like doped with anxiety so it's just you know it's a yeah. it's trying to bluff you and trick you and everything so if you just do the opposite actually you know what i mean it's just like you better just stay in your house because everything's really bad right now and you feel right. terrible you don't want people to see you. you just go like that means i should probably go out of my house and right, right. <laughs> when you're anxious whatever your brain is telling you do the exact opposite thing because your brain is an idiot like yeah, yeah. Just, you can't listen to your your brain at that point so all everything we've talked about for the last 10 minutes is all about the second fear like unmasking that second fear and not letting it be a thing so you know she's talking about how important is it to unmask panic and see these two separate fears how important is it to learn how to spot second fear and send it packing? So you, you have to. <clears throat> so, and again, that the way to recovery is desensitization. So you only get better at dismissing the, the, the what ifs the more you do it. Yeah. So desensitization means exposing yourself to the things that make you panic and learning to ignore or replace or whatever it is your tool is. Yeah, it's just like the really bad news here is that you have to panic to get better. Yeah, the only way out is through. I say, you you have to be afraid before you're not That's afraid. So good, I love that line. The only way out is through. the only way out is through. I didn't. I didn't, I believe that that was attributed to either Winston Churchill, who said, "When you're walking through hell, keep going," or Robert Frost may have said that. I don't even know. Okay. I've used it for years, but I didn't make it up. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, that's the only way you can do it, you know? And then she starts to go through like each of the individual symptoms, you know, I guess we can kind of skim through. Yeah. Sorry. There might be some people coming in. Behind oh, me. by all means. Guests are always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I see you look behind you. So, um, so only a bogey remains, which the word bogey is not something we use in the U S so much, but I guess, Oh, it's, it's Vronsky. It's Ronsky. I love Ronsky. I lo- I'm a huge fan of Holly's dog. <laughs> I don't know why. I just love her. <laughs> um, yeah. So must you let a physical feeling hold such terror is the way she starts this paragraph. And it's, it's a really solid question. Must you let a hot feeling in your stomach or a burning flash, pins and needles, like weak feeling in your legs? Do you have to let those things spoil your life? Yeah. She you know? may- Do you have this line where she says um, she's talking about, um, I think it's palpitations or something to do with the heart. And she says, like, I can't find it now. She says, oh, you know, I had, or it's like those skipped heartbeats. I think it's yeah. just like yeah. she was like, oh, there was a period of time um, when I was working hard and I was quite stressed and I had quite a few um, episodes of, like, these skipped heartbeats. Sure, sure. Like, um, but, like, sure enough, they, I didn't really pay any attention to them and they went away. And 
and I've never had them since. And she said, can you imagine if I'd spent the last 30 years worrying and spending my whole life, my whole last 30 years worrying about these palpitations and my heart has served me so well. All just this fine. Time. Imagine yeah. ruining my life. You know, it, it would have been a colossal life. waste of time. <laughs> right? I mean, yes, imagine. It's, it's the, the really sad part as well, isn't it? Like I know. everything that you're worrying about and, and anxious about and questioning all this it's complete waste of time like <laughs> it's just all but that's the saddest part about it it is true it is kind of in the end and and you will reach that conclusion when you really find the courage learn to truly 100 percent accept and learn to start to recognize the difference between the first fear and the second fear you know, don't let the second fear happen. When you get to those points, you start making progress. You just start to realize like, I wasted a huge amount of time on what yeah. turned out to be like phantom stuff. Like really, I spent yeah. so much time like poking my freaking chest. If I had that time back, <laughs> write a damn opera or something. I don't know what I would do, but yeah, that's true. So she does go through this and we could kind of bruise through the symptoms, I suppose. Um, I don't want to talk too much about symptoms, but Let's talk about the sedation thing. Oh, yeah. She, Continu- talks- yeah. she talks about sedation. And it even came up in the Facebook group. Somebody asked about, about that. So she says, um, if, like, if like this, you, you may need, I'm not sure what she because I can't seem to get a hold on a doctor. Well, I mean, so she's basically talking about when you get at wit's end. You know, you, uh, what do I do? I can't, I don't know what to do here. I'm at my wit's end. I, I'm worn down by this. And she actually mentions in the book, um, you may need complete rest in the form of continuous sleep for a few days, which I'm not saying that's not, that's wrong, but it, it's extreme. And she's yeah, talking about continu- she's talking about like supervised continuous sedation, like a doctor literally puts you to sleep for several days. And I, I'm not sure what I necessarily think about that. I mean, I understand that you could get literally to the point of nervous breakdown or exhaustion. You know, I've, I've heard of people who have been hospitalized due to exhaustion. Yeah. So I think, yeah, my sort of interpretation, I guess that the continuous sedation does sound quite extreme as in like being asleep for all that time. Yeah. I think maybe there's something in it of just, I just know when you're really tired and like all your nerves are completely like jangled. Yeah. It's really hard to sort of, do you know what I mean? Cause we talked about, you've got to find that sort of like tiny bit of logic in your brain to remember what to do when you're sort of yes. angry. So I think that it can be, if you're really like jangled and you can't think straight even slightly, maybe it is, maybe it can be a good thing to just catch up on your sleep or maybe just like use sedatives for a week or something at night just to make sure you try and get some sleep and then it helps you like build the sort of strength to be able to have the courage to sort of like. Yeah. Stuff. She actually mentions that too. Sedation is particularly necessary if you cannot sleep. So yeah. I, I get it. I bel- and again, somebody had mentioned in the group, because I didn't remember if she was a psychiatrist or psychologist. I don't know if she was a medical doctor or not, but it does. This is a hard topic because I, I know that when I was at my worst, I remember very clearly being at my doctor's and the first time he ever prescribed an antidepressant for me and gave me the insulin speech. If you were diabetic, you would take your insulin. Okay. And, I, and I was in such bad shape that day. I will never forget this day. And I remember looking at him and I had to get back in the car with my wife and drive back to our house. And that seemed like an insurmountable task to me. And I remember looking at him and saying, I wish, cause he said like these, it, you, you had to start taking the pills and it might take a couple of weeks for them to, to help, which is true with, with SSRIs. And I remember looking at him and saying, if, uh, if you could just give me a shot that made me sleep for two weeks until this worked, I would take it. So I under, and I meant it. I literally meant it. I understand how somebody could get to that point where I just, I need to be away from this. So my view on sedation and using sedatives, I mean, continuous sedation, that's extreme. And that's between you and your medical doctor, yeah, but um, sedatives as a break, she's, she's almost using it as it'll give you a break yeah. and you need the break. So I understand the need to build some sort of physical strength back through rest i get that but at the same time i don't like the sedatives because they are they can mask they mask your symptoms 
and suddenly you find uh, I'm better as long as I have my Valium. No, yeah, sure. I think that's the really important bit, isn't it? Like she's not saying the, the, the sort of, not dangerous, that's the wrong word to use, but the, the, the thing about using like um, benzos so right. you make it when you're feeling anxious, it takes, that is the complete opposite of facing right. the anxiety. It doesn't teach you anything. It's fine. You might feel better and it gets you through and you're able to go and go to work or whatever. Right. Then, then fine. And sometimes I think when I was sort of in that place, I was, I was really grateful for them because it stopped me like losing my job and stuff, you know, like right, right. before I sort of really kind of got my head around what I needed to do. It, it got me through a lot of situations, but when you know what to do and if you've up to this video, then you should, <laughs> you should sort of have, have an some idea, idea of what right. you need to do now is so don't take the tablet because you're trying to run away from your anxiety but if you want to, and obviously you talk to your doctor about this first, but if you want to sort of use it to give yourself a break to be able to muster enough energy to have mm -hmm. the courage to then go like, and now I'm going to start facing and accepting. Right. I don't really think it's that big a deal. And I don't think it's that big a problem. Yeah. I just, you know, whatever gets you through to the point where you're able to go. To like, do the, okay. the constructive work. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny because she actually mentions at one point, I don't know if you have this, this paragraph or not, but she says people with nervous, she, she calls it nervous illness. That's so old fashioned. People with nervous illness seem to take particular delight in doing without sedatives as soon as possible. Yeah. And so that, that's really good. That's a good outlook that says, you know, they may try to do without them too soon. She's almost cautioning against not taking them. Yeah. In my experience, I think it depends on the person. Like I did not want to use them no matter what, because I'm just stubborn that way. I'm not saying I was right or wrong. But I do remember that there were times for me that I can remember laying in bed at night and just the, the pounding of my heart, like just not being able to go to sleep and giving in and saying, you know what, I, I need, this is crazy. And I would take maybe half a quarter of a pill and it would just be enough so that I'd be able to get a little bit of sleep. Yeah. I think that's important to be able to get. I, I even I, yeah. And I am as opposed to these medications as you will find walking the planet because there's so many pitfalls to them. And I would say if you are the type of person that wants to use them judiciously and you can't wait to not use them and you never lose sight of, I don't want to use these, I, I can kind of get on board on that. But yeah. even me, the anti-medication guru, I would, I, you know, he would give me like 90 Xanax cause they're like dirt cheap, unfortunately, you know, and so he'd give them to me and I'd wind up having to dispose of, you know, 87 of them. I would yeah, take a yeah. little quarter of a pill at a time. And he would laugh at me. He's like, look, you know, I was like, I'm not a small guy with 215 pounds or whatever. Like, what are you doing? I have like 85 pound women that take a whole one of these, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but anyway, judicious use is probably not a bad thing, but I do think that the way she talks about sedation in the book is a little bit extreme. Like don't try and get off them too soon. And I think most doctors today, knowing what we know about addiction would say, yeah. no, I want you off them as soon as possible. Well, remember this was written back in the... Like the 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe they didn't know about the sort of addiction. Of they the did not. Problem. They did not. When, when sedatives, especially the benzos, were introduced, you know, they were a panacea. But then all of a sudden we realized like, wow, you can physically become addicted to these things very quickly. And, yeah. and they don't work. I'll mention it really quickly since we're on the subject. There's a tolerance that builds up. So if you're using yeah. Valium or Xanax or Ativan or whatever the hell it is every single day, you need more and more to achieve the same effect. And then there's yeah. a maximum dose and then it's not doing anything anymore. So now you yeah. have a physical dependency and you're still having breakthrough panic and it's, it's a bad road to go down. So judicious use of sedatives, please. But just make sure. Yeah. And it's just, it's that differentiation of, Differentiation? That's not a word. It's that sure it difference is. of, <laughs> of take, just make sure you're not taking it to escape your yes. day anxiety. Yeah. You know? yeah like yeah. that won't help you. That won't, remember, you've got to panic to get better. Right. So it's just to give you, just to give you a, a break. A break to be able to sleep, to get your sure. sort of strength up and get your courage up. And, yep. And sometimes it's, you know, think of it as a tool too, because I think you were telling, you're saying, that for you, you discovered like, well, you were feeling really horribly, but if you took a pill, it went away. And I was so like, oh, wait that a minute. Was that's a clue. Up. Yeah. That's a clue. Like this is probably not, you know, it's not really a bad thing. 
Also, I used to use them not just for sleep, but I would get very sort of like, um, just I couldn't eat anything when I was so anxious. And I'm already like a kind of thin person. So yeah. I would then be getting like hyperglycemia. And, do you know what I mean? It's just horrible and I couldn't eat and stuff. And so sometimes I would take it a, a, a tablet to feel better enough that and then i would just like scoff down a dinner and be like yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually and um it's, <laughs> it's important to keep my strength up and to keep your sort of physical health up. i'm not saying everyone should go and take <laughs> and they want to eat a dinner I'm just that saying, acts, part of a nutritious <laughs> breakfast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway tough topic very tough topic she, let, tough. let's talk about she goes into other ways of conquer conquering fears there are other ways to conquer fear other than unmasking and uh, analyzing and unmasking it. Yeah. And, and this is where she's talking about how like solving one fear actually winds up solving others sort of by association. Yeah. She talks about um, someone who's like really uh, scared and, and fearful, fearful of yeah. their yeah. and something to do with their heart. And when she looked further into it, she was, so scared about her heart because she was scared of dying. And so mm -hmm. she decided to just address her fear of death. And then that got her over her fear of her heart. It has, you know, the heart symptom then wasn't a problem. Yes. If you have palpitations and you're not scared if you have a heart attack and die, then you're not going to be scared of the palpitations. I mean, so. Right, exactly. Which is, which is kind of important. And I think not only from the practical matter of like solve the big fear and the one or you solve the foundation fear and the ones that are built on top of it go away. Yeah. Um, which I think is what she's saying, but it also is a good example of like, which fear are we trying to attack here? We're not attacking fear of the shopping mall. We're attacking fear of the fear. So exactly. let's solve the right fear. I, that's my takeaway on that. And I'm going to skip to kind of the near the end of the chapter where she talks about how no new symptoms can arise, which is a little bit of a misnomer. Oh, uh, uh, what do you think? Well, I, I think people are going to say, because she, she literally, well, at least in my version of the book, she literally has a, a heading over this paragraph in bold. Yeah. No yeah. new symptoms can arise. I don't think a lot of people listening to us would say, oh, bullshit, they can't. Like, you know, I have my heart races and I have stomach problems. And now suddenly I also have these vision problems. So, yes, I have new symptoms. Yeah. But I think the point she's trying to make is like adrenaline is limited in what it can do. Yeah. So yes, it can affect your heart and your breathing and your vision and your balance. And we can name all of those things, but it, it can't do more than that is what she's trying to say. Yeah. She's trying to point out the limiting, it's, it has limited ability to do things. Yeah. Your legs can't drop off. Right. Exactly. You're not going to get, or people, I've seen people who worry like, I'm going to have some sort of permanent damage because of this. No, 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 not really. I mean, I, it's not, that's not good to marinate and stress all day long. We know that, but there's not, yeah. You know, no, you're not going to have permanent damage for staying in an anxious state. You won't. I think that it, this is completely non-scientific. In my head, I think like it's a bit like doing a workout all the time. Can the that be thing. that? Yeah, it must be good for your heart in a way. Well, I mean, I guess it might be, but yeah, sure. No one would, argue that, you know, and which is a really good way to think about that, if you will. Like no one would tell you that you're doing a bad thing if you spent your day, like what people get, I have that. You have a treadmill and sometimes I can set up a work surface on it and I will spend four hours walking while I'm working. Oh, cool. not, not all the time, but I have done it or an hour or two hours or a half hour, whatever time I have. If I feel like 10 minutes. <laughs> two minutes, you know, whatever it is. But no one would ever argue. I'm sure my doctor, if I said, hey, doc, I walked for four hours yesterday while I worked, you'd be like, awesome. That's great. You know, like yeah. no one would tell you to like, no, you should sit down. Like, you know, it's. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, a sedentary life is much, much healthier. Much better. Much better to just stay calm and like, no, no one ever say that. Like, you should be exercising your body. So anyway, when she says no new symptoms can arise, I, I think that's probably, she's just saying, look, there's a limited number of things this can do. Yeah, but what I did, for, well, I when I first read this book, when I was very um, sort of down and, and under it all, I found a lot of um, comfort in that chapter because I was really scared of, of, being sick and vomiting and stuff like that yeah, and she so says yeah. like so if you if you if nausea and vomiting isn't one of your symptoms of a panic attack then it probably won't be it probably means that your stomach's okay and she says we all know that person who under stress like one person will just like run to the toilet and the other person like heaves and and the other yeah. person turns inwardly and like your symptoms have sort of pre pre presented themselves and that's kind of like yes 
what it is. And it's true. Like, you know, I know some people right. like puke at the tiniest bit of stress and, you know, and other yeah. people, like people have their different things, you know, some yeah. people are stomach people and other people are, you know. Yeah, I've never been a stomach person. Like it's, <laughs> Yeah, like I've never, even when I have, when I'm in a major panic, I don't feel like I'm going to be, I'm going to vomit or I have to. No, me neither, but it was yeah. my biggest fear that I would actually. Well, we panic. should talk about that because we go through, I mean, we could spend two hours going through all the symptoms she talks about, but I would say what she does in this is she starts to go through each individual symptom, palpitation, racing heart, slowly beating heart, which is a thing too. Um, missed heartbeats. She talks about a lot of heart stuff, trembling, the inability, feeling like you can't breathe. And I would almost say lump in the throat, feeling like you can't swallow, being dizzy, nausea, that sort of stuff. She talks about all of those things. And I, and I would think as opposed to, I mean, if there's anything specific you want to talk about, we certainly can, but you could read through and she just tries to explain why each of those things happen. Yeah, yeah. This is why you get nauseous. This is why you get dizzy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not, it, chapter seven is good in terms of symptoms, in terms of getting some explanation of why you get dizzy or yeah. why you get nauseous. So, it, it's good to go through that. But maybe, it's good to, like, dispel the, the mystery about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. oh, I can do yeah. all these things. Like, well, there's actually like a really good scientific, very logical reason why you're. Absolutely. Dizzy. Yeah. And she does a pretty good job of like giving you a quick overview of this is why your heart beats slowly sometimes. And someone in the group actually mentioned that, that they were feeling anxiety with a slow heart rate. I'm not dangerously slow. It's not, you know, it's not that, but um, it's called bradycardia. It's not that, but it's, um, it's a vasovagal response. But she talks about that too. And I would say read through the symptoms, but we probably should talk about the emetophobia thing, the fear of vomiting yeah, yeah. a little bit. Um, I have known quite a number of people over the years who have been dealing with this sort of problem where the fear of vomiting is an actual phobia. It's called emetophobia. It's a real thing. Yeah, and that was, that's me. I mean, yeah, really, nah. yeah, I still am in a way. But sure, I, sure. I, but I, I think it can, when you have emetophobia, it can really present a problem in terms of being able to really accept. And especially if you're emetophobic and you have stomach problems under stress, if you feel yeah. nausea or you have bathroom issues when you are in an anxious or panic state and you are afraid, literally have a phobia of vomiting, you have a very special challenge ahead of you. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't know how severe your phobia was, but. It, but I, it used to be severe, but I, yeah, in, in sort of getting better from being scared of panic attacks, I've learned that it's just, it's, it's the same as a fear of heights or a fear sure. of, you know, I could be, I could have a fear of, um, you know, my toe tingling. It's the same thing. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is. It's your fear of it. Right. And that's what I realized. I was telling you before we came on air yeah. uh, about. <laughs> That my husband is a sailor, and so you know he deals with seasickness and people getting seasick and stuff all the time. And to me, it's just like it, it was like the worst thing possible. And and I was just like, my God, how do you deal with that? And he's just like, oh, just sick and just carry on. Like, what do you mean? Like, it's no big deal. Like, sure. So, and he tells stories and funny stories about and this person was puking and puking and, <laughs> and everyone's laughing and and I would be like just sort of like you know sweating and yeah, just like, like mortified oh, right worst to, yeah most horrifying terrifying thing that i'm listening to yeah and um yeah and i from sort of that i realized in learning to not trust my anxious thoughts i started to realize that like if other people are okay with this then okay it's probably, it's probably me it's not actually a, as bad as i think it is you know and that, that, i've had to learn to sort of look at other people's responses to things yeah and be like, oh, that's what everyone else thinks about it. So maybe it's yeah. not as big a deal, you know? I think that's, a, um, that's impressive. And I, you know, that ENTP, fellow ENTP, the T part, the thinking part. Oh. You, know, you did the thing, right? The T. So um, I think that maybe this is just a theory based on a little informal thing we did in the Facebook group yesterday on personality types. Being more predisposed to thinking rather than feeling, rational rather than emotional probably helped you do that. And I think if you're dealing with emetophobia, part of the problem with that, it's actually classified as a simple phobia, like being afraid of heights or dogs or something like that. It's hard to expose yourself to the thing you're afraid of because nobody yeah. will like make themselves vomit. That's a, its own problem. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's really hard because what I have found, and I don't have any really solid advice for this, is people who are emetophobic 
who have stomach issues when they're anxious get stuck hard sometimes because they can't, they first have to solve the vomiting fear before they can truly accept the anxiety symptoms. Yeah. Because if, because it's not that they're afraid of the, they are afraid of the fear. The panic disorder is that the agoraphobia is that, but the emetophobia sticks itself right in the middle and says, I, I'm a terrified of that. So I must stop this symptom. I must yeah. stop the nausea. So it's a tough one. I think if you have emetophobia alongside your anxiety disorder, it probably, you got to really attack that one first in a way. And I, I don't I've know how. Well, people say they've had success with hypnotherapy for that. Because emetophobia? It's, sure. Yeah, because it's such a simple yep. thing in some ways, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm, and I, I know that I've heard of, I have a friend of mine actually here on Long Island has dealt with it. And like she had a therapist who, again, it's hard to do exposure with something that you don't, you can't make happen or you won't make happen because it has its own set of issues, but pictures, video they used with her, the sound, like this is a recording of somebody being ill, which is gross. Yeah. But if you're dealing with immunophobia, that may help you. You learn to desensitize yourself to the sound and the, the, the picture and blah, blah, blah. So it's something that you probably have to look at if you're if you have that problem. You I really look recommend at um, marrying a sailor, <laughs> right? Because the person is living full time in the world of seasickness. Or go and go and chat to a sailor because they deal with it all the time and they just think it's fun. They think it's funny when people get seasick. Sure, sure. So uh, anyway, that's the deal about emetophobia. And I think uh, uh, we've pretty much exhausted. Like I said, read through the symptoms. We don't have to go through each one. But uh, that's essentially chapter seven. She tries to dispel each individual symptom because she's trying to, I think, teach you or reassure you so you can start to learn and recognize what second fear is and not add to it. So she's trying to give you some rationality of the, why is my heart racing? Why am I nauseous? Why am I this? Why am I that? And if you could get an understanding of that, then it might help you turn the, you know, just relax when you have the first fear and not, not be afraid of being afraid. Yeah, totally. That makes any sense. So you have anything else you want to add on chapter seven? I don't think so. We're good, right? Chapter eight is, uh, which the next one we'll do, we'll try and keep these going. Uh, chapter eight is specifically about agoraphobia. So, which was never a thing for you, right? You never really, you never. Oh, no, it. no. Yeah. Oh, it was. Oh, okay. I was, I didn't remember if that was or not. So that'll be the next one we do. And I would say, um, yeah, we'll wrap it up. And as always, like comment on the video if you want. And um, you can't tell I'll, me I say like too much. <laughs> please don't say Holly says like. <laughs> I didn't hear you say like this much. I do more. say it too much. My mom tells noticed. me I say it too much. So really? I, it's good. I kind of like it. it. Is it possible that it was your mother that commented on the last video? <laughs> Mom, if you're trolling us. <laughs> <laughs> Holly's mother is a YouTube troll. Who knew? Who knew? Um, yeah, so comment on the video if you have questions and stuff. I'll put a link to the Facebook group. It's really for the, the, the podcast that I do for Billy, but we're going to use it for this too. Yeah. And if you want to get involved and ask questions. Test. Yeah, oh, the personality test. Should we, we'll mention, I talked about it on the one I did with Billy earlier, but let's mention that really quickly. I found this interesting. I want to know what you think. I commented on it yesterday too. So we've now had, it was, I posted a link where you could take like the Myers-Briggs personality assessment thing. Um, you can't take it. Look, it's, it's, I'm a big behavioral science geek, but it's not a hard science. So take it with a grain of salt. Most people find it really insightful. Like, wow, this really does describe me. But the point is at this point, we've had 20 something people respond. They took the test and said, oh, this is my personality type. And the interesting thing that I find is that of the 20 something people that responded, one of the, the axis that the test measures is, are you more prone to think or feel? So yeah. are you more, and it's really kind of the more, are you more rational and reasoning? Or are you going to react more emotionally to things? And everybody has the preference for feeling over thinking, except the two people you're looking at on the screen, Holly and I have our T's instead of F's. And one other person, which is Diane Levesque. And as it turns out, those are the three people in the conversation that are furthest along in their recovery. Yeah. What's weird I, is that we've all got exactly the same person. Yes. You, you and I That's and sweet. Diane were the only people that came up T as opposed to F thinking rather than feeling. And we are the furthest along. I'm not saying, just like I said in the, in the other episode, I'm sure you guys are going to watch the one with Billy too. I'm not drawing any conclusion from that. It's just, I find it interesting. But what I think is interesting is if I'd filled that in five years ago, I think I would have come It'd out. It'd be different. It'd yeah. be different. Yeah, sure. And I, I think you, you can change over time. Yeah, I've, yeah. But I've learned to be more. 
more analytical or rational. Sure. So I would say, yeah, if you want to join the Facebook, follow the link to the Facebook group and take the personality test if you want to jump through it. It was just a fun thing to do. And uh, thanks for everybody who shared. And you can ask questions, comments there. If you're doing exposure work and you want to share your videos, get involved with that. Holly's in the group, so she'll see it all. And uh, you can comment on YouTube or on my website, whatever. We'll, we'll try and answer questions as we can. So that's the deal. We'll see you guys for chapter eight next time. Cool. Later. Bye. Bye.